Alice's Last Adventure by Thomas Ligotti Preston, stop laughing. They ate the whole backyard. They ate your mother's favorite flowers. It isn't funny, Preston. <laughs> Preston and the Starving Shadows a long time ago, Preston Penn made up his mind to ignore the passing years and join the ranks of those who remained forever in a kind of half-world between childhood and adolescence. He would not give up the bowl's satisfaction of eating insects, crispy flies are his favorite, nor that peculiar drunkenness of a child's brain, induplicable once grown-up sobriety is set in. The result was that Preston successfully negotiated quite a few decades without ever coming within hailing distance of puberty. In this state of arrested development, he defiantly lived through many a perverse adventure, and he still lives in the pages of those books I wrote about him, though I stopped writing them some years ago. Did he have a prototype? I should say so. One doesn't just invent a character like Preston, using only the pitiful powers of imagination. He was very much a concoction of reality, later adapted for my popular series of children's books. Preston's status in both reality and imagination has always held a great fascination for me. In the past year, however, this issue has especially demanded my attention not without some personal annoyance and even anxiety. Then again, perhaps I'm getting senile. My age is no secret, since it can be looked up in a number of literary reference sources. Over twenty years ago, when the last Preston book appeared, Preston and the Upside Down Face, one reviewer rather snootily referred to me as the Grand Damned of a particular sort of children's literature. What sort you can imagine, if you don't otherwise know, if you didn't grow up, or not grow up as it were, reading Preston's adventures with the dead mask, the starving shadows, or the lonely mirror. Even as a little girl, I knew I wanted to be an author, and I also knew just the kind of tales I would tell. Let someone else give pre-adolescence their literary introductions to life and love, guiding them through those volatile years when anything might go wrong and landing them safely on the shores of incipient maturity. That was never my destiny. Instead, I would write about a puckish little character based on a real-life childhood playmate of mine whose deeds of mischief were legend throughout the small town where I was born and raised. As Preston Penn, my erstwhile chum could throw off the shackles of material existence and explore the mysteries of an upside-down, inside-out, faintly sinister, and always askew universe. The embodiment of topsy-turvydom, Preston gained a reputation as a champion of misbehavior and an adventurer who looked beneath the surface of everyday things. Pools of rainwater, tarnished mirrors, moonlit windows, to discover a stunning sortilege, usually with the purpose of stunning in turn his perennial foe, the dictatorial world of adulthood. A conjurer of stylish nightmares, he gave his grown-up adversaries fits and sleepless nights. No dilettante of the extraordinary, but its personification. Such is the spiritual biography of Preston Penn. But to give credit where credit is due, it was my father, just as much as Preston's original, who provided the spark for the stories I've written. To put it briefly, father had the blood of a child coursing through his big adult body, flooding with fancy the overly sophisticated brain of Foxborough College's associate professor of philosophy. Typical of his character was a love for the books of Lewis Carroll, and thus the genesis of my name. When I was old enough to understand such things, my mother told me that while she was pregnant, my father willed me into a little Alice. That sounded like something he would say. I remember one occasion when father was reading through the looking-glass to me for the umpteenth time. Suddenly he stopped, 
closed the book and said to me, as if in deep confidence, that there was more in the Alice books than anyone knew, but that he knew and someday would tell me. To Father, the creator of Alice, as I later came to see it, was a symbol of psychic supremacy, the sterling ideal of an unstructured mind manipulating reality to its whim and gaining a kind of objective force through the minds of others. And it was very important to Father that I share the Master's books in the same spirit. See, honey, he would say while rereading through the looking glass to me, See how smart little Alice right away notices that the room on the other side of the mirror is not as tidy as the one she just came from. Not as tidy, he repeated with professorial emphasis, but chuckling like a child, a strange little laugh that I inherited from him. Not tidy. We know what that means, don't we? I would look up at him and nod with all the solemnity that my six seven, eight years could muster. And I did know what that meant. I felt intimations of a thousand misshapen marvels, of things going haywire in curious ways, of the edge of the world where an endless ribbon of road continued into space by itself, of a universe handed over to new gods. Father's imagination seemed to work non-stop, squinting at my roundish child's countenance, saying, Ooh, look how she shines so bright. He called me Little Moon Face. You're a little moon face, I playfully talked back. No, you are, he would say. Am not. Are too. We'd continue this back and forth until both of us burst out laughing. When I got older, my features became more angular, an involuntary betrayal of my father's conception of his little Alice. I suppose it was a blessing that he did not live to see me succumb to the despoilments of time, saved from this heartbreak by a sudden explosion in his brain while he was giving a lecture at the college. So father never had the chance to tell me what it was that he knew about the Alice books that nobody else did. But perhaps he would have perceived that my maturation was only skin deep, that I just superficially picked up the conventional behaviors of an aging soul. Nervous breakdown, divorce, remarriage, alcoholism, widowhood, stoic tolerance of a second-rate reality, without destroying the Alice he loved. She must have been kept alive, or so I would like to think because it was she who wrote all those books about her soulmate Preston, even if she has not written one for many years now. Oh, those years, those years. So much for the past. At present I would like to deal with just a single year, the one ending today, about an hour from now, judging by the clock that just chimed 11 p.m. from the shadows on the other side of this study. During the past 365 days I have noticed, sometimes just barely, an accumulation of curiouser and curiouser episodes in my life. A lack of tidiness, one might say, which may be partly due to the fact that I've been drinking rather heavily again. Some of the previously mentioned episodes are so elusive and insubstantial that it would be a real chore to talk about them except perhaps in terms of the moods they leave behind like fingerprints, and which I've learned to read like divinatory signs. My task will be less taxing if I can find myself for the most part to the grosser incidents I have to recount, thereby making it easier to give them a modicum of the sense and structure I could use just now. A tidying up, as it were, neat as a pin, straight and sure as the green lines on the yellow page before me. I should start by identifying tonight as that immovable feast which Preston always devotedly observed, celebrating it most intensely in Preston and the Ghost of the Gourd, even if time has almost run out on this holiday, according to the clock ticking at my back, though from the look of things the hand seems stuck on the hour I reported a couple of paragraphs ago. Perhaps I misjudged it before. 
For some years I've made an appearance at the local suburban library on this night to give a reading from one of my books as the main event of an annual Halloween fest. Tonight I managed to show up once again for the reading, even if I hesitate to say everything went as usual. Last year, however, I did not make it at all to the costume party. This brings me to what I think is the first in a year-long series of disruptions unknown to a biography previously marked by nothing more than episodes of conventional chaos. My apologies for taking two steps backward before one step forward. As an old hand at storytelling, I realize this is always a risky approach when bidding for a reader's attention. But here goes. It was one year ago today that I canceled my reading at the library to attend an out-of-town funeral of someone from my past. This was none other than that sprite of special genius whose exploits served as the prima materia for my Preston Pen books. The excursion was one of pure nostalgia, however, for I hadn't actually seen this person since my twelfth birthday party. It was soon afterward that my father died, and my mother and I moved out of our house in North Sable, Massachusetts, see Childhood Homes of Children's Authors for a photo of the old two-story frame job, heading for the big city and away from sad reminders. A local teacher who knew of my work and its beginnings in North S sent me a newspaper clipping from the Sable Sentinel, which reported the demise of my former playmate and even adverted to his second-hand literary fame. I arrived in town very quietly and was immediately overwhelmed by the lack of change in the place, as if it had existed all those years in a state of suspended animation and had been only recently reanimated for my benefit. It almost seemed that I might run into my old neighbors, schoolmates, and even Mr. So-and-so, who ran the ice cream shop, which I was amazed to see still in operation. On the other side of the window, a big man with a walrus mustache was digging ice cream from large cardboard cylinders, while two chubby kids pressed their bellies against the counter. The man hadn't changed the least bit over the years. He looked up and saw me staring into the shop, and there really seemed to be a twinkle of recognition in his puffy eyes. But that was impossible. He could never have perceived behind my ancient mask the child's face he once knew, even if he had been Mr. So-and-so and not his look-alike son, grandson. There we were, two complete strangers gawking at each other, both of us actors performing together on the same stage, but playing out different dramas. It brought to mind one of my early books, Preston and the Two-Faced Clock, wherein time goes by so fast that it stands still. I shook off the black comedy of errors at the ice cream shop and proceeded to my destination, only to find that another farce of mistaken identity awaited me there. For a few moments I paused and looked up at the words on the lintel atop the double doors of that cold colonial building, G. V. Ness and Sons, Funeral Directors. Talk about time going by so fast that it stands still, or seems to. During the years I'd lived in North Sable, I had entered this establishment only once. Goodbye, Daddy. But such places always seem familiar having that perfectly vacant, neutral atmosphere common to all funeral homes, the same in my hometown as in the suburb outside New York, good riddance, hubby, where I'm now secluded. I strolled into the proper room unnoticed, another anonymous mourner who was a bit shy about approaching the casket. Though I drew a couple of small-town stairs, the elderly, elegant author from the big city did not stand out as much as she thought she would, but with or without distinction it remained my intention to introduce myself to the widow as a childhood friend of her deceased husband. This intention, however, was shot all to hell by two ox-like men who rose from their seats on either side of the grieving lady and lumbered my way. For some reason I panicked. You must be Dad's cousin Winnie from Boston. 
The family's heard so much about you over the years, they said. I smiled widely and gulped deeply, which must have looked like a nod of affirmation to them. In any case, they led me over to Mom and introduced me under my inadvertent pseudonym to the red-eyed, half-delirious old woman. Why, I wonder, did I allow this goof to go on? Nice to finally meet you, and thank you for the lovely card you sent, she said, sniffing loudly and working on her eyes with a grotesquely soiled handkerchief. I'm Elsie. Elsie Chester, I thought immediately, though I wasn't entirely sure that this was the same person who was rumored to have sold kisses and other things to the boys at North Sable Elementary. So he had married her. What do you know? Possibly they had to get married, I speculated cattily. At least one of her sons looked of sufficient age to have been the consequence of teenage impatience. Oh, well. So much for Preston's vow to wed no one less than the Queen of Nightmares. But even greater disappointments awaited my notice. After chatting emptily with the widow for a few more moments, I excused myself to pay my respects at the coffin side of the deceased. Until then I deliberately averted my gaze from that flower-crazed area at the front of the room, where a shiny pearl-gray casket held its occupant in much the same position as the traveling tomb racer he'd once constructed. This part of the mortuary ritual never fails to make me think about those corpse-viewing sessions to which children in the nineteenth century were subjected in order to acquaint them with their own mortality. At my age this was unnecessary, so allow me to skip quickly over this scene with a few tragic and inevitable words. Bald and blemished. That was rather expected. Totally unfamiliar. That wasn't. The mosquito-faced child I once knew was now repulsively bloated and saggy, swollen up and puffy-lipped like some unidentifiable corpse the cops might find in a river. Patently, he had overfed himself at the turgid banquet of life, lethargically pushing away from the table just prior to explosion. The thing before me was a portrait of all that was defunct, used up the ultimate adult. But perhaps in death, I consoled myself, his child self was even now ripping off the false face of the overgrown up before me. After paying homage to the remains of a memory, I slipped out of the room with a stealth my Preston would have been proud of. I'd left behind an envelope with a modest contribution to the widow's fund. I had half a mind to send a batch of gaping black orchids to the funeral home with a note signed by Letitia Simpson, Preston's dwarfish girlfriend. But this was something that the other Alice would have done, the one who wrote those creepy books. As for me, I got into my car and drove out of town to the nearest fine hotel, where I found a nice suite, spoils of a successful literary career, and a bar. And as it turned out, this overnight layover must take us down another side road, or back road if you like, of my narrative. Please stand by. A late afternoon crowd had settled into the hotel's cocktail lounge, relieving me of the necessity of drinking in solitude. After a couple of scotches on the rocks, I noticed a young man looking my way from across the room. At least he appeared young from a distance. Emboldened by booze, I walked over to sit at his table, and with every step I took he seemed to gain a few years. He was now only relatively young, from an old dowager's point of view, that is. His name was Hank DeVere, and he worked for a distributor of gardening tools and other such products. But let's not pretend to care about the details. Later we had dinner together after which I invited him to my suite. It was the next morning, by the way, that inaugurated that year-long succession of experiences which I methodically trying to sort out with a few select examples. Half-step forward coming up, pawn to king three. I awoke in the darkness specific to hotel bedrooms, 
abnormally heavy curtains masking the morning light. Immediately it became apparent that I was alone. My new acquaintance seemed to have a more developed sense of tact and timing than I had given him credit for. At least I thought so at first. But then I looked through the open doorway into the other room, where I could see a convex mirror in a wood frame on the wall. The bulging eye of the mirror surveyed the entirety of the next room, and I noticed that something was moving around in the reflecting glass. A tiny, misshapen figure seemed to be gyring about, leaping and twirling in a madcap way that should have been audible to me, but it wasn't. I called out a name I barely remembered from the night before. There came no answer from the next room, but the movement in the mirror stopped, and the tiny figure, whatever it was, disappeared. Very cautiously I got up from the bed, robed myself, and peeked around the corner of the doorway like a curious child on Christmas morning. A strange combination of relief and confusion arose in me when I saw that there was no one else in the suite. I approached the mirror, perhaps to search its surface for the little something that might have caused the illusion. My memory is vague on this point, since at the time I was a bit hung over but I can recall with spectacular vividness what I finally saw after gazing into the mirror for a few moments. Suddenly the sphered glass before me became clouded with a mysterious fog, from the depths of which appeared the waxy face of a corpse. It was the visage of that old cadaver I'd seen at the funeral home, now with eyes wide open and staring into mine, or so it seemed for a moment before I put on my glasses, and when I did, all I saw was only my own face, a corpse-like kisser if ever there was one, Preston and the looking-glass ghoul, I thought, feeling almost inspired to take up my pen once more, and this inspiration was again aroused a short while later when I was checking out at the front desk, as the desk clerk was fiddling with my bill. I happened to look out of a nearby window, beyond which two chubby children were romping on the hotel lawn. After a few seconds the kids caught me watching them. They stopped and stared back at their audience, standing perfectly still, side by side. Then they stuck out their tongues at me before running away, and how much they looked like the odious Hatley twins featured in Preston and the Talking Grave. The room took a little spin that only I seemed to notice, while others went calmly about their business. Possibly this experience can be ascribed to my failure to employ any post-debauch remedies that morning. The old nerves were somewhat shot, and my stomach was giving me no peace. Still, I've remained in pretty fair health over the years, and I drove back home without further incident. That was a year ago. Now get ready for one giant step forward. The old queen is now in play. In the succeeding twelve months I have noted a number of similar happenings, though they occurred with varying degrees of clarity. Most of them approached the fleeting nature of déjà vu phenomena. A few could be pegged as self-manufactured, while others lacked a definite source. I might see a phrase or the fragment of an image that would make my heart flip over, not a healthy thing at my age, while my mind searched for some correspondence that triggered this powerful sense of familiarity, the sound of a delayed echo with oblique origins. I delved into dreams, half-conscious perceptions, and the distortions of memory, but all that remained was a chain of occurrences with links as weak as smoke rings. But today, as pumpkins leer from porches and pillowcase ghosts swing on tree branches, this tenuous haunting has gained a more substantial consistency. It started this morning and continued throughout the day with increasingly more defined and evocative manifestations. Again, my hope is that I may tidy up my psyche by documenting these episodes beginning with one that now seems a prefiguration of those to come. Lucid exposition is what's needed. Thus, place, the bathroom, time, 
a little after 8 a.m. The water was running for my morning wash-up, cascading into the tub a bit noisily for my sensitive ears. The night before, I suffered from an advanced case of insomnia, which even extra doses of my beloved guardsman's reserve stock did not help. I was very glad to see a sunny autumn morning come and rescue me. My bathroom mirror, however, would not let me forget the sleepless night I'd spent, and I combed and creamed myself without noticeable improvement. Chessy was with me, lying atop the toilet tank and scrutinizing the waters of the bowl below. She was actually staring very hard and deliberately at something. What is it, Chessy? I asked with the patronizing voice of a pet owner. Her tail had a life of its own. She stood up and hissed, then yowled in that horribly demonic falsetto of threatened felines. Finally she dashed out of the bathroom, relinquishing her ground for the first time since she was a kitten. I had been loitering at the other side of the room, a groggy bystander to an unexpected incident. With a large plastic hairbrush gripped in my left hand, I investigated. I gazed down into the same waters. And though at first they seemed clear enough, something soon appeared from within its porcelain burrow. However, it retreated too soon back into the plumbing for me to say what it was. All that remained was a squiggly imprint on my memory, but I could not bring it into mental focus. It was as if I saw the thing and did not see it at the same time. Even so, whatever it may have been engendered a flurry of impressions within me, as of a confused nightmare that leaves behind only a pang of horror upon its dreamer. I wouldn't even bring up this installment in my story if I didn't think it related to another that occurred later on. This afternoon I began preparing myself for the reading I was to give at the library, the preparation being mostly alcoholic. I've never looked forward to this annual ordeal and only put up with it out of a sense of duty, vanity, and other less comprehensible motives. Maybe this is why I welcomed the excuse to skip it last year, and I wanted to skip it this year, too, if only I could have come up with a reason satisfactory to the others involved, and, more importantly, to myself. Wouldn't want to disappoint the children, would I? Of course not though heaven only knows why. Children have made me nervous ever since I stopped being one of them. Perhaps this is why I never had any of my own, adopted any, that is, for the doctors told me long ago that I'm about as fertile as the seas of the moon. The other Alice is the one who's really comfortable with kids and kiddish things. How else could she have written Preston and the laughing this? or Preston and the twitching that. So when it comes time to do this reading every year, I try to put her on stage as much as possible, something that's becoming more difficult with the passing years. Oddly enough, it's my grown-up's weakness for spirits that allows me to do this most effectively. With each sip of scotch that passed my lips today, I felt more at ease. The sun was going down in a pumpkin-colored blaze when I arrived at the little one-story library. Some costumed kids were hanging around outside. A werewolf, a black cat with a long curling tail, an extraterrestrial with fewer fingers than humans and more eyes. Coming up the walk was Tinkerbell escorted by a pirate. In spite of myself, I couldn't help smiling at the whole scene. For the first time in quite a while, this pageant of masqueraders brought back memories of my own childhood when my father took me trick-or-treating. His love of this night was easily as avid as Preston's. Having gotten into the spirit of this eve, I was feeling quite confident as I entered the library and confronted a flock of youngsters. But the spell was maliciously broken when some smart aleck called out from the crowd, shouting, Hey, look at the mask she's wearing. After that, I propelled myself down several linoleum hallways in search of a friendly adult face. Finally, I passed the open door of a tidy little room where a group of ladies and the head librarian, Mr. Gross, 
were sipping coffee. Mr. Gross said how nice it was to see me again and introduced me to the moms who were helping out with the party. My Williams read all your books, said a full-figured Mrs. Harley. I just can't keep him away from them. Not for lack of trying, I thought, judging by the quietly infuriated tone of her voice. My only reply was a dignified smile. Mr. Gross offered me some coffee, but I declined. Bad for the stomach. Then he wickedly suggested that, as it was starting to get dark outside, the time seemed right for the festivities to begin. My reading was to inaugurate the evening's fun, a good spooky story to get everyone in the mood. First, though, I needed to get myself in the mood, and pardoned myself to use the ladies' room where I could refortify my fluttering nerves from a flask I had stowed away in my purse. As a strange and embarrassing social gesture, Mr. Groves offered to wait right outside the lavatory until I finished. I'm quite ready now, Mr. Gross, I said, glaring down at the little man from atop an unelderly pair of high heels. He cleared his throat, and I almost thought he was going to extend a crooked arm for me to take, but instead he merely stretched it out to indicate, in a stock gentlemanly manner, the way to go. I think he might even have bowed. He led me back down the hallway toward the children's section of the library, where I assumed my reading would take place as it always had in the past. However, we walked right by this area, which was dark and empty, and proceeded down a flight of stairs leading to the library's basement. Our new facility, bragged Mr. Gross, converted one of the storage rooms into a small auditorium of sorts. We were now facing a large metal door painted an institutional shade of green. It looked for all the world as if it might lead into the back ward of a madhouse. I could hear screaming on the other side, which sounded to me like the cries of bedlamites rather than the clamor of rambunctious kids. Which one will it be tonight? asked Mr. Gross while staring at my left hand. Preston and the Starving Shadows, I answered showing him the book I was holding. He smiled and confided that it was one of his favorites. Then he opened the door for me, pushing its weight with both hands, and we entered what chamber of horrors I knew not. Over fifty kids were sitting in or standing on or knocking over their seats, shouting from the podium at the front of the long, narrow room. A pointy-hatted witch was outlining the party activities for the night and when she saw Mr. Gross and me arrive, she began telling the children about a special treat for us all, meaning that the half-crocked lady author was about to deliver a half-cocked oration. Let's give her a big hand, she said, clapping as I stepped onto the rickety-looking platform. I thanked everyone for inviting me to their party and fixed my book on a lamp-bearing lectern decorated with wizened cornstalks. Then I tried my best to warm up the crowd with a little patter about the story everyone was going to hear. When I invoked the name of Preston Penn, a few kids actually cheered, or at least one did at the rear of the room. I assumed it was William Harley. Just as I was about to begin reading, something happened I had not been led to expect. The lights were switched off. It slipped my mind entirely. Mr. Gross apologized afterward. In the dark, I noticed that facing each other on opposite sides of the room were two rows of jack-o'-lanterns glowing orange and yellow from on high. They all had identical faces and looked like mirror reflections of one another, with triangular eyes and noses and wailing O's for mouths. As a child, I was convinced that pumpkins naturally grew this way complete with facial features and phosphorescent insides. Furthermore, they seem to be suspended in space, their means of support concealed by the darkness, which also hid within it the faces of the children. Thus, these jack-o'-lanterns became my audience. But as I read, the real audience asserted itself with foot shuffling, whispers, and some rather ingenious noises made with the folding wooden chairs they were sitting in. 
I also heard a devilish giggling in the words I employed to describe the snickering laughter of the very imp whose story I was reciting. Toward the end of the reading, there came a low moan from somewhere in the back and it sounded as if a seat had fallen over along with whoever was sitting in it. It's all right, I heard an adult voice call out. The door at the back opened, allowing a moment of brightness to break the spooky spell, and some shadows exited. When the lights came on at the end of the story, I noticed that one of the seats in the last row was missing its occupant. Okay, kids said the parental witch after some minor applause for Preston. Everyone move their chairs against the walls and make room for the games and stuff. The games and stuff had the room in a low-grade uproar. Masked children ruled the night, indulging their appetite for sweet things to eat and drink, disorder for its own sake, and high-spirited pandemonium. I stood at the periphery of the commotion and chatted with Mr. Gross. What exactly was the disturbance all about? I asked him. Did one of the kids have a spell of some kind? He took a gulp from a plastic cup of cider and smacked his lips offensively. Oh, it was nothing. You see that child there with the black cat outfit? She seemed to have fainted. But once we got her outside, she was all right. She had on her kitty mask all through your reading, and I think the poor thing hyperventilated or something like that complained that she saw something in her mask and was very frightened for a while. At any rate, you can see she's fine now, and she's even wearing her mask again. Amazing how children can put things right out of their minds and recover so quickly. I agreed that it was amazing, and then asked precisely what it was the child thought she saw in her mask. I couldn't help being reminded of another cat earlier in the day that also saw something that gave her a fright. She couldn't really explain it, replied Mr. Gross. It was just something that came and went. You know how it is with children. Yes, I dare say you do know, considering you've spent your life writing about them. I took credit for knowing how it is with children, knowing instead that Mr. Gross was really talking about someone else, about her. Not to overdo this quaint notion of a split between my professional and my private personas, but at the time I was already quite self-conscious about the matter. While I was reading the Preston book to the kids, I had suffered the uncanny experience of having almost no recognition of my own words. Of course, this is rather a cliché with writers, and it has happened to me many times throughout my long career, but never so completely. They were the words of someone entirely alien to me. They were written by some other Alice, and I'm not her, at least not any more. I do hope, I said to Mr. Gross, that it wasn't the story that scared the child. I have enough angry parents on my hands as it is. Oh, I'm sure it wasn't. Not that it wasn't a good scary children's story. I didn't mean to imply that, of course. But, you know, it's that time of year. Imaginary things are supposed to seem more real. Like your Preston, he was always a big one for Halloween, am I right? I said he was quite right and hoped he would not pursue the subject. Imaginary things were not at all what I wanted to talk about just then. I tried to laugh it away. And you know, Father, for a moment it was exactly like your own laugh and not my hereditary impersonation of it. Much to everyone's regret, I did not stay very long at the party. The reading had largely sobered me up, and my tolerance level was running quite low. Yes, Mr. Gross, I promise to do it again next year, anything you say. Just let me get back to my car and my bar. The drive home through the suburban streets was something of an ordeal, a trip made unnerving as well as hazardous by pedestrian trick-or-treaters. The costumes did me no good. The same ghost was everywhere, a lean little wraith that I imagined was following me home. The masks did me no good, and those Prestonian shadows wavering against two-story facades. Why did I have to choose that book? Certainly did me no good at all. 
Alice, the other one, could take all this madness, every nightmare her creator threw at her. That horrible Reverend Dodgson. I don't care if there is more in his books than anyone knows. I don't want to know. I wish I had never heard of him, that corrupter of little minds. I just want to forget it all. Alice and the disappearing past. Dr. Guardsman, administer your medicine in tall glasses, but please, not looking ones. And now I'm safe at home with one of the tallest of those glasses resting full and faithful on my desk as I write. A lamp with a shade of Tiffany glass, circa 1922, casts its amiable light on the pages I've filled over the past few hours, though the hands of the clock seem locked in the same V position as when I started writing. The lamplight shines upon the window directly in front of my desk allowing me to see a relatively flattering reflection of myself in the black mirror of the glass. The house is soundless, and I'm a rich, retired authoress widow. Is there still a problem? I'm not really sure. I remind you that I've been drinking steadily since early this afternoon. I remind you that I'm old and no stranger to the mysteries of geriatric neuroticism. I remind you that some part of me has written a series of children's books whose hero is a disciple of the bazaar. I remind you of what night this is and to what zones the imagination can fly on this hallowed eve. I need not, however, remind you that this world is stranger than we know, or at least mine seems to be, especially this past year. And I now notice that it's very strange, and once again, untidy. Exhibit 1. Outside my window is an autumn moon hanging in the blackness. Now, I have to confess that I'm not up on lunar phases, loony faces, as Preston might say, but there seems to have been a switch since I last looked out the window. The thing seems to have reversed itself. Where it used to be concaving to the right, it's now convexing in that direction. Last quarter changed to first quarter, or something of that nature. But I doubt nature has anything to do with it. More likely the explanation lies with memory. So it's not the moon as such that's troubling me. The real trouble is with everything else, or at least what I can see of the suburban landscape in the street-lighted darkness. Like writing that can only be read in a mirror, the shapes outside my window, trees, houses, but thank goodness no people, now look awkward and wrong. Exhibit 2. To the earlier list of reasons for my diminished competence, I would like to add an upcoming alcohol withdrawal. The last mouthful I guzzled from that glass on my desk tasted strangely vile, noxious to the point where I doubt I'll be having any more. I almost wrote, and now will, that the booze tasted inside out. Of course, there are certain diseases with the power to turn the flavor of one's favorite drink into that of a hell broth. Perhaps, then, I've fallen victim to such a malady. But I remind you that though my mind may be terminally soused, it has always resided in corpora sano. Exhibit 3. The Last. My reflection in the window before me. Perhaps something faulty in the melt of the glass my face. The surrounding shadows seem to be overlapping it a little at a time, like bugs attracted to something sweet. But the only thing sweet about Alice is her blood, highly sugared over the years from her drinking habit. So what is it, then? Shadows of senility? Or those starving things I read about earlier this evening come back for a repeat performance? Since when does reading a story constitute an incantation calling up its imagery before the body's eyes and not the mind's? Something's backward here. Backward into a corner. Checkmate. Now, perhaps this seems like merely a cry of wolf, however sincere I may be. I can't actually say that it isn't. I can't say that what I'm hearing right now isn't some Halloween trick of my besotted brain. The giggling out in the hallway, I mean. 
that demonic giggling I heard at the library. Even when I concentrate, I'm still not able to tell if the sound is inside or outside my head. It's like looking at one of those toy pictures that yield two distinct scenes when tilted this way or that, but at a certain angle form only a merging blur of them both. Nonetheless, the laughing is there, somewhere, and the voice is so familiar. Uh, <laughs> Exhibit 4. The shadows again. They're all over my face in the window. Stripping away, as in the story. But there's nothing under that old mask. No child's face there, Preston. It is you, isn't it? I've never heard your laughter, except in my mind. Yet that's exactly how I imagined it would sound. Or has my imagination given you, too, a hand-me-down, inherited laugh? My only fear is that it isn't you, but some imposter. The moon, the clock, the drink, the window. This is all very much your style, only it's not being done in fun, is it? It's not funny at all. Stop it, Preston, or whoever you are. And who is it? Who could be doing this? I've been good. I just got old, that's all. Please stop. The shadows in the window are coming out. No, not my face. Not my little moon face. I can't see anymore. I can't see. Help me, Father.